I will split my message in two parts. Uh, on the first part, I will talk about choosing your faith, and on the second part, I will uh, I will uh, talk about choosing your priorities. And as we stand like this, uh, we we can read together from Hebrews chapter eleven, verse twenty-three. A story, a great story about Moses. By faith, Moses, when he was born was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Amen. Uh, I will uh, start with uh, this photo. Maybe you know about this. Okay. Something is not working here. Okay. Appreciate your help. Not sure how many of you guys have seen this photo before, but it was uh, widely spread all over the internet maybe about five months ago. And uh, this is the story of Titan. The CEO chose to use carbon fiber to build the Titan structure rather than titanium or steel. Also, the CEO chose to fire a person who raised concerns about the safety of Titan. Also, the CEO chose to not follow industry safety standards. In the end, four people chose to pay 250k to visit Titanic. Those four people chose to sign a waiver that mentioned that numerous times. On the first page, the death word, word was mentioned three times. In the end, as you know, all those five people, the CEO and the other four guys, died by implosion. Basically, their death was the total sum of their decisions. This is what I will tell you today at the starting of this sermon. Our life is the sum of all the decisions we make every day. You choose which school to graduate, you choose which uh, job to perform, where to live, your house, who to marry, what to eat, choosing your clothes, and so on. And all the choices you make are highly influenced by emotions, desires, and the values you have. And now pay attention. Basically, your values determine your choices. I don't want to change your choices tonight. I would like to change your values tonight. Because if you change someone's values, his or her choices will be changed also. The simple act of deciding supports the notion that we have free will. And basically, we waive the benefits and costs of our choice, and then we cope with the consequences. And now pay attention. You cannot control the consequences of your choices. You can only control your choices. There may be endless ways to look at the types of the choices you make. But in the end, choices define us. You are who you are based on the choices you make. Basically, choices exemplify our individual character. And now your character is highly influenced by your faith, by your faith. Poor choices lead to a life of misery, while wise choices lead to peace and contentment. How do I know if I'm really walking by faith in Christ? I would like to, 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 to look with you at Moses' example and to test our faith. 
because there are so many religions all over the world, and basically I'm only allowed to live once. It's not like when you play games. You are fired, you are shot at, right? You, you exit from the game, take a coke and go back. A new life. No. Basically, offline, in the offline mode, there is only one life. If you have only one exam, you will treat that exam very seriously, right? If you only have one choice to buy a house, you will pay a lot of attention to that house, right? So in the end, I cannot live multiple lives. That's why I want to pay a lot of attention to my faith. First, how can I know that I'm living a real faith? The real faith will choose God over Pharaoh. That's what uh, verse 24 says. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Moses has to choose between two completely differently, different lives. The life that led to him one day become, becoming Pharaoh with untold prestige and power or the life that would abandon everything he knew in order to lead God's people out of slavery. Just imagine, if you were him, what would you have chosen? Because if you don't choose God, you are left with Pharaoh. And uh, basically God sent his son to die for you. Satan hasn't done this, although most of the people are choosing him. God will give you peace and forgiveness. What Satan will give you if you choose him? John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to full. Basically, Satan is stealing your purity, your innocence, your peace, your blessings. After that, he's not stopping here. He's going to kill your conscience, your moral principles. In the end... He is destroying your reputation, your future, your family. On the other side, God is giving you an abundant life. That's why we must consciously strive to follow Christ every day in order to live a life of faithfulness to God. Amen. Ten years ago, uh, I was invited by a pastor from Deva, the city where I live right now, to move from Arad. I mean to move from a church with over 1,000 members to a church with 300 members. I was just starting to build a house in Arad. My parents were near me. We had, me and wife, my wife had two, two kids on that time. And basically God told us to move to a known, unknown land. Ten years later, I received a phone call. I was looking at the phone number. I didn't know who was calling me. It was a guy who told me, Christy, I'm from the same church where you were in Arad. I heard when you moved to serve Christ, when you left everything and started from scratch in Deva. On the other side, I chose to go to Bucharest the capital of Romania, and uh, basically I spent 10 years working for Satan. I have no life, I have no, my health is destroyed, all what I have are 60 bucks in my pocket after 10 years of serving Satan. And he said, I'm so sorry that I had chosen such a different style of life compared to you. I saw your family, I saw your church, I saw your serving, and I'm jealous. He's, he asked me, do you think that God will forgive me? And I said, yes. And he said this, he told me this, what about those 10 years lost? This is your challenge tonight, to choose God over Pharaoh. Second, real faith 
will choose holiness over sin. Now, trust me, most of the teenagers I know, and most of the families I know, and most of the Christians I know, do not have a problem choosing God. They have a problem choosing holiness. I mean, they will raise their hands when the pastor will invite them to follow Christ. But the issue is that they are stopping right there. While here, I see in verse 25 that Moses, it says, cho choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. If you choose God, you will choose to be like him, and he hates sin. Do you hate sin? Testify yourself today. Do you hate what God hates, or you love what God hates? Pay attention now. Sin is sweet today, but it's full of bitterness tomorrow. Holiness is bitterness now. It's full of bitterness now, but it's sweet. All the days after tomorrow, for eternity. First Peter chapter 4, verse 3 says, For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked, it doesn't say when we walk, when we walked in the lewdness, lust, drunkenness, rivalries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. And now testify yourself. What about your colleagues? What about your neighbors? What about the other guys? In regard to this, they think it's, it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. When you come to God, you have to put a stop to your sinful life. From that moment on, sin is no longer possessing you or controlling you, but the nature of God is starting in you. And when you have the real faith, this is what's happening. The mindset is changed. The vocabulary is changed. The works are changed. That's why when somebody is raising their hand to follow Christ, you will not change their clothes first. <laughs> You will not change what, he, what he's looking at first. The Holy Spirit wants to change his mindset first. And if the mindset is changed, of course the vocabulary is changed. And if the vocabulary is changed, of course the works are changed. Imagine an area of land. You want to grow tomatoes. You cannot reap tomatoes if you don't sow tomato. But before sowing, you have to clear your area of vegetations, weeds, and so on. Today, I'm asking God to clear our hearts of our sinful desires. Amen. In the end, your past will be forgiven. You will talk about sin, but, talking, but looking at the past, it's no longer present. If you repent today, Hosea chapter 10, verse 12, sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fellow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. Now, the issue is that repentance hurts. You, do you remember that, uh, I, I think it was one of the first uh, YouTube uh, videos which went popular. Charlie bit me. <laughs> you bit my finger. <laughs> it hurts Charlie. <laughs> I'm usually uh, uh, looking on that video and laugh, laugh a lot. Because I have kids and those scenes are, are also happening in my family. Okay, uh, repentance hurts. It brings tears to your heart, but do not for, for, uh, forgive, do not forget, after the surgery comes the healing. There is no healing without surgery first. There is no healing without a treatment first. Thomas was a chaplain uh, during the Civil War and also a pastor from the ninth uh, uh, century. And during a visit to the dentist, he was asked, does that hurt? And uh, Thomas said, of course it hurts. 
it's in your business as in my profession. We have to hurt before we can help. Guys, forgive, uh, uh, repentance hurts. If, I, if I'm not sorry about my sins, I will never live a holy life. Because uh, you cannot depart from the sin you still like. Third, real faith will choose heaven over earth. Verse 26 says like this, Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. To the reward. Moses' choice was between uh, the temporary earthly wealth and the everlasting rewards of heaven. That's why it's, it's so important where you are looking at. Do you remember Stephen? He lived a holy life and holiness brings suffering. Do you see? Choosing God, choosing holiness, choosing earth. But in order, choosing uh, uh, heaven. But in order to be prepared for heaven, you will meet suffering. Because in suffering, in despair, in isolation, your character will be changed. And you, will, you need to become like Christ. This is the role of the Holy Spirit, to transform us and be like Christ. And when the wedding will happen in heaven, we should look like Christ. It says about Stephen, Acts 7.55, but he being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven. What this means? Looked up, looked up to heaven. I'm usually walking with my kids uh, inside our stores. You have Costco here and others, Walmart. We have Kaufland, Lidl. And basically, um, I'm, I'm taking uh, my, my, uh, my youngest boy by hand. I want to go with him to the fruits, uh, to oil, to salt, to bread, because on the other side he wants to go to the toys. Okay, we depart from the toys and he's like, Father, Dad, Lego, Lego, where's Lego, where's my puzzle, where's my Lego? This is what, what's, what, uh, uh, what uh, it really means, looked up to heaven. Okay, you are doing your homework, you are doing your job, you are driving, but all the time your heart, your eyes are up to heaven. Overall, your eyes contribute to 85% of your total knowledge. So it's extremely important where you, looked, where you look at. Do you look at the stones which are being thrown on you? Or you look up to heaven? Why it's important to look up to heaven? Because every decision in your life will be influenced by what you are looking at. About Eve, it says in Genesis 3, 6, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and you know what's coming after this verse. After this verse, about Moses, it says, "For he looked to the reward." And let me ask you today, tonight: Do you filter your information, or let your eyes consume everything they want? Because in the end, it's mind, eye, information, decision. If your mind has faith in God, your eyes will be pure. Therefore, your information will be right. In the end, your decision will be right. What are you looking at every day? We have so many options to view on our phones. We have so many movies we can see. We have so many YouTube videos. And every information coming to our, uh, to our mind through our eyes is influencing us. That's why you will see girls pretty desperate and pretty sad that they haven't met the, the target of 100 likes per day. 
about their clothes or their dressing. And maybe the boys will be sad, but, but okay, I uploaded a photo with my new car and nobody cared. <laughs> When was the last time you saw a photo about a guy praying? <laughs> you see, we have so many photos, we have so many information. Unfortunately, we have so, so less, so few revelation. Horatius was a Scottish preacher in the 80s. At night, his last action as he retired for the night was to draw aside the curtain in his room and gazing up into the starry heavens and say, perhaps today, Lord. And every morning as he rose, his first movement was to raise the blind and looking out upon the breaking dawn, say, perhaps today, Lord. That's how our lives should look like. If I know that in the end I will die and I only have two places where I will spend my eternity, I will pay a lot of attention to the every step I make. I will pay a lot of attention to every decision. Imagine that there will come billions and billions of years after you die. All those billions of years will be highly influenced by your 20, 40, 60, or 80 years. I was graduating the primary school and I was invited by my teachers to go with the class to a beach vacation because our school wanted to reward us. My parents disagreed with this, but in the end they gave me all the money they had do not imagine they had a lot of money. We were nine kids there. But they said, we don't need the money this week. We will be fasting for you because we see your heart. We see your style, we see your vocabulary. And we see that you are pretty similar with the prodigal son who just wants to escape, who just wants to go to visit the world and the earthly pleasures. One day I was going away from the shore, although I didn't know how to swim. Suddenly I no longer felt the bottom of the sea under my feet. I tried to swim desperately, came at the surface and cried, help. Now I was drowning again. I had no more power to swim back to the surface. I knew I was lost. But God heard my parents' prayers. They were praying and fasting for me at home. And this is one of the biggest blessings you can have in your life, to have somebody praying for you and fasting for you. One woman heard my cry. She pulled me out of the water. I was saved. I knew it was God and there. But I didn't change my life. I, I continued to lie at the school, to talk like the others, to come on Sundays and play here, but without being changed. Three years later, something changed in my life. I was 14 years old. My colleagues who were inviting me to smoke with them in the toilets, they used to bring pornographic materials at the schools, no mobiles then. And it was harder and harder for me to resist. I was with one foot out of the church and I knew I had to make a decision. I went to a church and there was a sermon and the pastor invited uh, the congregation to pray and he said, if somebody wants to receive Jesus in his heart, please come here in the front. And basically, I was on the last desk at the balcony. I, I'm not sure how I just, I was just going there in the upfront. I was crying. I asked God to change my heart. A few days later, 
there was a prayer night where most of the guys prayed to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I was 14 years old. I was, uh, all the guys who were asking to be baptized with the Holy Spirit stood there at the choir. And I was there and the pastor said, uh, how old are you, 14? Get out of here. You are too, too younger, too young. I was so sad, but I needed that. I needed that. And uh, next day I was going to a different church. I went to a, to a pastor and confessed all my sins, all my past. And this time I didn't want to go straight to the prayer place in the center of the church. I was 14, guys. And I was thinking, I will wait till the prayer starts and after that I will slowly go farther. Hear me loudly. God, it's looking at your heart. And if you are honest with you and your past and your future and your present, God will bless you. At the first prayer, I was, when all the eyes were closed, I was just going like this. I was crying for Lord. I knew that if something is not changed on that evening, I will go with my colleagues to all the sins I knew. And when the prayer started, there was one elder who came near me. He put his hands on my shoulder, on my head, and uh, he prayed with me. And uh, basically I received the Holy Spirit in, the, in those moments. At the first prayer, I was forgiven, I was cleaned, I was changed. 23 years later, I'm, I'm here with you guys. And I wanted to tell you that God loves you. And I wanted to tell you that God can clean your sins, can give you a new heart, and can give you a new future. I'm not sure if you have recently testified your faith, but this is the evening you can testify yourself and see if you really live by faith.